Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. From this morning's Gospel reading from Matthew 3. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So far, the word of the Lord. John the Baptist burst upon the Jewish scene like a thunderous voice from God, preaching in the wilderness region of Judea. He was acclaimed by the people as a prophet of God. His prophecy was unique, for his was the privilege of announcing the arrival of the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah of God. His message was a call to repentance and for genuine renewal and piety, but framed in the context of preparing for the kingdom of heaven. The days of Judea circa 30 AD saw a continued occupation by the Romans and a growing unease with the religious types. It was, as Paul would put it to the Galatians, the fullness of time in which the Christ appeared. John's role was that of a court royal herald, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John's arrival marked a time of change, the end of what was and the beginning of a new day, the coming of the kingdom of God. The physical description of John introduces him as a peculiar, even eccentric prophet. In being clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt, even his physical appearance marked him as a man accustomed to living off the land rather than the comforts of a village or even a city. His diet seems to be that of an extreme survivalist. Everything about him came from his surroundings in the wilderness, like Elijah and the prophets before him. John's presence broke the comfortable silence of spiritual apathy and benign neglect with the mighty word of God. The call of God was sounded neither from temple nor synagogue, but was heard as a cry from the midst of the wilderness. The Baptist message was focused on the very center of the Jewish faith, since the call to repentance meant turning away from sin and turning toward God. He was a stern realist, and when it came to the matters of right and wrong, calling for confession, for integrity in daily living. We see that from Luke's account, he emphasized the call upon the faithful to share with the needy, to bear the fruit of faith with personal virtues, to seek not financial gain at the expense of others, and to live a life of contentment rather than always striving to obtain more. His was the voice to prepare the way for the Christ, lifting the valleys of poverty that embitter hearts lowering the hills of pride and materialism, smoothing the rough road of justice, trying to show the people that the kingdom was imminent and that it demanded a radically different worldview and resulting lifestyle. His call to repent meant to live like God intended for his people to live. As the religious types voiced their disapproval, John takes them on with a stern warning. Even now, he says, the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Earlier in this morning's gospel reading, we note that Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him. And they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. In a time and a place where spiritual malaise and apathy were rampant, John's words and challenges piqued the Jews' curiosity. He was a prophetic rock star to whom people flocked. In Luke's account, we're told that he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and that crowds came out to be baptized by him. It is evident that his ministry was understood and respected as multitudes would leave the comfort of their homes and their villages and their cities to go out into a wilderness region to see him and hear him. It's also evident that his baptism was understood as one of repentance, 
for the people were coming to be baptized and were confessing their sins. The people thought highly of John's prophetic ministry. But what was John's opinion of his own work? Well, we know what he says of himself. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. John is a prophet, divinely commissioned and sent out by God. He had made such an impression on the people that they thought mm, maybe he was the Messiah. But John tells them, he who is coming is mightier than I. It's as if the Baptist was saying to them, I am only his forerunner and herald. And if you think I'm such hot stuff, just wait till he shows up. You ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, how much greater is the one coming after John? I'm not worthy of carrying his sandals, he says. How great then is the coming one if a prophet such as John the Baptist, appointed by God for this holy task, can't even carry his shoes? Well, the answer must be the coming one is God's son. John's opinion of himself and his work is not self-abasement offered up in a false humodesty. The one coming is mightier. Now John recognizes that his personal might is solely from the strength of God's word and the mission he's been given. It wasn't a false humility. So who could be stronger than a prophet wielding the power of God's word? Only he himself who is the word. Now with the difference between the persons noted, so also is the difference regarding their work. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's ministry was marked by the people being baptized by him in the River Jordan as they confessed their sins. John places his baptism of repentance in a comparison to a greater baptism to come. He baptizes in a Jewish rite that employs water. God's Son will crown his redemptive work by baptizing with the Holy Spirit in fire. A divinely appointed man may use water in the sacrament. Only the Son of God can pour out the Holy Spirit, and that he only does after he completes his saving work and ascends to his heavenly throne. When John describes his own strength, it's as if he is saying, I, on my part, am baptizing you with water for repentance. That was the power placed into his hands by God. It was what marked him as the forerunner of the Christ. The baptism of John did not create the repentance in the people by his baptism. Rather, they came confessing their sins. They were moved by the repentance that was worked in their hearts by God. And the Greek does not say with water only, as some have suggested, implying that John's baptism was merely symbolic. As the Spirit affects repentance and faith throughout the whole Old Testament, so also God worked in both John's preaching and in his baptism. Justly, it is also misguided thinking that suggests that our baptizing of people is a mere water baptism that only ser serves as a sign or a symbol of the person's commitment, that it's not the same as being baptized by the Holy Spirit, which is thought of the Spirit coming upon a person without any divine means of grace. Such a view is a false notion, and it casts disparaging opinion on God's given means of grace as vehicles by which the Spirit comes to us and substitutes for it human emotions, feelings, and dreams as the demonstration of God's working in one's life. No, the one coming, says John, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And to understand this, we must hear what Jesus says prior to his ascension in Acts 1, when he says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the time of Pentecost is a capstone to the work and the mark of the Christ. Only the Son who had gone to the Father after completing his redeeming work on the cross 
could send the promised comforter. It's just like Jesus told his disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. The baptism that the church brings to people is one with the Holy Spirit in fire, not a symbolic washing with water. It is as Luther wrote, and each believing soul inspire with thine own pure and holy fire. Baptism is a means of grace given to us by God to work forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Thusly, we are to take comfort that by our baptism in the word and with the word of God, in the water and with the word of God, it is God's working by the Holy Spirit that brings us into the forever family of faith and into the kingdom of God. Even as God's word promises, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. Baptism is no symbol or sign or act of piety on our parts. It is as Luther teaches us, in the way that one sees what a great and excellent thing baptism is, for it delivers us from the devil's jaws and makes us God's own. It suppresses and takes away sin and then daily strengthens the new man. It is working and always continues working until we pass from this state of misery to eternal glory. Baptized in the water and clothed with the Holy Spirit and fire, we are called, gathered, and enlightened by Jesus to be his people on earth and fellow heirs of heaven's grace and power and glory. John the Baptist came as the Christ herald in the wilderness, offering a call and a baptism for repentance. He foretold the coming of the mighty Christ and promised that the baptism that he would offer would connect people with God through the working of the Holy Spirit. That Christ came and gave us his means of grace by which our salvation is effected. And so for this, and for all the good things that come to us by the grace of God, we all say, thanks be to God. Amen.